Hello, everybody. Hello. Greetings. Sorry about that. Working out on familiar Wi Fi here. One moment. Great, this is Carolyn. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. As usual, my video is not working, so I'm just going to have to be a, an invisible participant. That is fine with me. Um, welcome. Thank you. Uh, just setting up to make sure I have all of this. Participants and attendees. Okay. All right. Um, let me start off. Again, I apologize. I am, I just finished a practice. So, that's why I'm a little bit out of breath and, and starting this up. I got stuck trying to figure out how to work a, a Wi-Fi that's not familiar with my computer. Okay, um, welcome everybody to January uh, January commission meeting. Um, uh, we do have a, I think it's a relatively uh, light schedule for us here in terms of the, the necessary have to, the things that we have to cover. Um, you all had a chance to see my agenda. If there's anything that is new or that is not in there, feel free to introduce at the end. Um, there is space for it to be introduced at the end. Um, so we are, the first thing I want to do is hit record. Shut down my participants so that they're it says it's already recording. It is recording. Um, the first thing I want to do is before we take care of minutes and and uh, everything else, I would like to give Sarah Ewell a chance. I want to introduce Sarah. This is her first uh, time on the board here, her first commission meeting with us. And so we certainly want to welcome her. We've had a, a period of time where we have been short on our commission and we are almost at full numbers. Sarah is the second to last person to come in, but I wanna give Sarah a chance to just introduce herself uh, briefly, tell us where, uh, who you are, what your, what your interest, what brings you to the commission. Um, and if people, if you know people in the commission or, or if people want to share where we know you from, we can do that, but Sarah. Thanks Ray, hi everyone. Um... I do know a few people here, which is exciting. Um, I so professionally, um, I am an assistant dean at Northeastern University, but I work in uh, totally online programs. So I, I work from home out here and have done that for a long time. Um, I grew up in Amherst and moved back here, left and moved back here to raise my family. I have three kids uh, who are six, almost 13 and 14. So kindergarten, seventh and eighth grade. Um, and have been making as much noise as I can for a long time, just about 
uh, equity and opportunities for kids in sports in the community. I also have um, a mom who's retired and lives in the community and is always looking for different ways to be involved. So, but mostly I think someone, I don't even know who, but someone um, I like have met with the superintendent a bunch of times. I've met with all sorts of coaches just about how are we increasing opportunities for our kids to, to play sports throughout their lifespan without them having to go play Cub sports, without um, all the transportations falling onto families. So um, I guess somewhere along the way, I made enough noise that um, they asked me to join the committee and um, excited to be here. Thank you, Sarah. I will say that um, I don't make the appointments. I sit on the interviews. I was excited to have Sarah uh, put in. I think uh, her her background in academia, but certainly her advocacy uh, as a parent of of you know students, young students, young community members that are that have been in our programs. As many of our commission have had kids that have come through our programming. Um, you know we know we know the two older ones because of basketball. And that's, that's so that I can speak later on about like I, my first my first interaction with Ewells was through basketball, has been through basketball. Um, I believe that, uh, you know, in looking at the way her kids and the kids around them are taken care of, I think Sarah is a, is a strong advocate for the, for the activity of, of kids in our sports programs and beyond. Um, and so welcome, uh, uh, we, we do have one more space that will be filled and I believe that it will be filled in by the time we have our next meeting. Um, uh, into the January minutes, I want to assume uh, that Matt is going to be able to do the minutes here again for us. I'm looking for Matt on the, Matt is not here. Uh, so in that case, do we have somebody who will be able to take minutes for us in Congress. Matt's absence? Do I have anybody that would be willing to take minutes in Matt's absence today? Uh, if you make the board. Uh, yeah, I mean, will the video be made available soon? Um, yeah. I, I, I'm not one to take minutes in real time, but with the video, okay. I, I was going to say, I was going to say, if I didn't have somebody that wanted to take minutes in real time, then we certainly could do it off of the video slash online transcript. I hate the, I hate the audio transcript of these because I stutter a lot. And, that, <laughs> and so I can't even read the thing. <laughs> I, I cannot read the transcript of this because I always uh, run for cover, but um, it's actually fun to take a look and see what they what they think that I'm saying. Um, uh, so thank you, Andy. If you would be able to do that, I would appreciate it. Yeah, I will. Thank you. Also, welcome, Sarah. By the way. Thanks, Andy. The, nice to see you. Yes. The second thing is, and I put it in my introduction in here. Um, uh, in, not in the introduction, but in my invitation to this meeting. Uh, it is increasingly a concern of town hall that we have an identified chair. Uh, there are people here who've said that they can't do the chair. I'm not going to twist arms. My whole thing is I'm not going to twist arms. If I need to have somebody become a chair and essentially just be a point person for for the commission words. I wanna make it clear that the reason why a chair is important for us is because you guys don't work for me. Uh, uh, the, and it, I'm, not, I'm not trying to twist anybody's arm on this, but you guys don't work for me as the rec director. Um, you are, you are a, a service for me. You guys are a community, so you're a service to the community that your voice is independent of mine. I should, uh, the way it's set up right now is that when people want to know what the rec commission is thinking of, the one name that they look at, the one name that they look for is mine because there is not a commission chair. There is not somebody who speaks as a spokesperson for the commission. And I haven't, I don't believe, stepped 
in the wrong direction in representing the commission's interests. Uh, I, I, not, I don't speak in advance of what I think is a consensus, but I think it does help if there's somebody, if there's somebody who can or would uh, be able to present themselves as a, as a chair, then that person and I could basically spend as much time as necessary, which is not very much time, I don't believe, but you could spend as much time as necessary for me to uh, you know, prep you, for me to have conversations with you. I think that gives me a chance to talk to a point person from the commission uh, as a, an, an even influence. You don't have to take the responsibilities that I have of putting together the, the agenda uh, of, of of lining up the agenda, I'll still be involved in that. If you want to take that over, you certainly can. But if the process right now of my putting together an agenda and running the commission meetings is okay with you all, it doesn't have to change. That part of it doesn't have to change, but we do need somebody to, town hall needs somebody to step forward and be a, a person of contact for the commission. Carolyn. Sorry, I was muted. Um, I am willing to do that for a bit of time. I think my term ends in June. Okay. And if that's you know too much of an inconvenience, then never mind. But I I know that you've been looking for someone for a year. <laughs> and, and it's been a soft push. It still is taking a soft push. But go ahead, Kellen. <laughs> um, I'd be happy to meet with you, like you know, downtown. Okay. Any day and just talk about what it means, but I don't think it sounds like it's a big burden. It feels like, okay. as you say, it's really just a point person and I've been on the thing for a while. So I, I could probably do that, but um, you know, it's only gonna last a few months. I appreciate it. And you can be the test case if you do it and it's as, and as clearly as low maintenance as I think it is, uh, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe it ends up being heavy and there's no, there's no sense if you need to step down from it for a lot of, for any different reason, then we can try and find a way to make that work. But, but if there are people who are looking as Carolyn get, gets ready to term out, maybe that's a chance for us to look and see what it is that that position entails. If it's something that we can do, maybe something you want to do more. I do want to, I mean, basically my pitch there, and thank you, Carolyn, you and I can talk about, about you know, sort of moving forward next steps. If you're okay with that, we'll certainly put it to a vote in a second. But uh, if that's uh, if that's something that that is okay with the commission, then you and I can take the next steps towards making that happen. I do just want to say that any commission members should feel free if if what we are doing doesn't work for you in terms of what your voice is, how much your voice is weighed, in terms of how I see. I don't think that I don't have the sense that people are concerned about about my misrepresenting or my taking your voice from you. But if there is a concern that you all have about, about what the commission can or should be doing, then, then you can speak through your, your commission chair, you can speak to me directly and we can change the way we're doing it. But in order to make the meetings work, I hope that people are okay with the way that we've been, we've been sort of operating up to this point. If it shifts because you all wanna shift it, I am, I am here as the director of recreation to speak to you and not speak for you. Kevin, is your hand up again? You. Hey, Ray, I was going to say, and Carolyn as well, you know, if, if uh, I can serve as backup or, you know, depending on how things go, um, we can talk about transitioning in the summer if that would, if that works. That'd be awesome. Thank you. Uh, so we have four members here and two members, two active members that are not here today. Uh, I believe that we definitely have, we have the quorum. Um, I believe we can take the vote uh, if there's a procedural issue about having those two people not here, but uh, uh, I would like to offer a vote to the commission as to whether or not Carolyn would be uh, acceptable as a chair. So all in favor, raise your hands. 
All opposed? Ray, I'm just wondering if maybe if just for dotting I's and stuff, if one of us would make the motion. I'm not sorry. That yes. or not. Yeah, but yes. um, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll make the motion for Carolyn to serve as chair. Motion for Carolyn to serve as chair. Now let's vote. All in favor. And a second. Do I have a second? I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I, you got to understand, I have, I am very, very little experience in, in No problems. problems. I've been on the planning board for a while, so this is like feed into me. But yeah, so if someone would second it, and then we'll go. This, is, this is Andy trying to, trying to be a last minute replacement as the chair. He knows the rules. <laughs> no, no, I'm kidding. Uh, is there a second? Go for it, Andrew. Let's see. I second. There's a second. I would like to now pause. I would like to now uh, ask for a vote. All in favor of Carolyn serving as chair. Aye. And then Carolyn, are you a yes also? Carolyn is the, Oh, Carolyn. If, I, if I get to vote, yes, I'm a yes. If you, Andy, will do the meeting running. <laughs> yeah. If you will do the, the uh, whatever that's called, the formal part. Robert's rules. Okay, because no one else really does that as well as you seem to be, you know, you're good at it. Okay. Is that okay? Happy to chip in as, as, the, as the chair uh, desires, Carolyn. Great. <laughs> Thanks. Awesome. Thank you. So uh, motion passes. Uh, congratulations, Carolyn. All right. Thank you. And again, Carolyn, you and I can speak offline uh, sure. about, about the opportunities, about what we do next. Um, okay. That taken care of. Uh, I'm looking in the, the I, I guess, for public comment. The next, the next thing on the agenda is public comment. Uh, there are no members of the public in the in the attendees pool except for one. We have Amy Rizeki here. If uh, Amy is here, uh, I can actually bring her off now if necessary. But Amy is here in a, a couple of capacities. Uh, but I am going to actually invite her right now into the room, and we'll be had a chance to meet her before. I'm going to invite her into the meeting room. I can move her back afterwards if necessary. Is she here now? Amy, are you here? I am. You just unmuted me. Yeah. Okay. I did. I apologize. Uh, Amy, Amy is, uh, uh, is uh, DPW. She is, uh, uh, she's here. She's been with us before. You all remember her from our, from our uh, CPAC proposals. Uh, Amy, could you share with us Sort of your role and what you and DPW are looking for in this in this uh, position inside the meeting. Sure. Yeah, I'm. I'm not here with a specific agenda. Um, I just know that, especially a lot of conversations recently um, regarding the playing fields um, have talked a lot about the the maintenance and the upkeep and condition and stuff like that of the playing fields. And um, while Ray Ray has been great at, you know, answering the questions that he knows. Um, it's the DPW staff that does a lot of that maintenance. Um, and so I just kind of want to be here to be able to answer questions if they come up or if I don't have answers, get them to you in the next meeting. But um, just kind of to, to make sure that um, we can get you guys the info that you need as, as you need it. Thank you, Amy. So uh, in terms of our field interests, in terms of our pool interests, uh, if, if and when we have issues, Amy and or uh, any other members of DPW that would be here from commission meeting to commission meeting are here to answer some of those questions that maybe I don't have. Uh, you know, we will be moving into some, as we get into the spring seasons especially, we'll be looking at questions of about availability, about upkeep, about maintenance. We'll be looking at access. Uh, these are all issues that I, I'm eager to have Amy's eyes and ears um, for in our, in our commission meeting. So welcome. Are there, I can say right now, are there any questions that, that we have about field? Uh, any questions that commission members have? I can, while she's here on, on our uh, panel, 
Are, are there any questions that anybody has uh, extremely pertinent or, or down the road for Amy and DPW? Because the transition, uh, I can put her back into the attendees room here, but the transition out of that out of that open question, do you have any field or or facilities related questions for DPW? The transition would be for me to pass over and talk to let Andy speak about CPAC. Um, and um, are there any questions about field? Any questions, comments, concerns about field or field maintenance scheduling or anything? Then I will return, Amy. Again, thank you. Raise your hand if you if you have anything you want to chime in on, or if there's anything that I need you for, I will be looking for you. Okay, thank you. Sounds good. All right, um, I can jump in on the CPAC uh, piece. So I actually was not present for our final vote, which uh, occurred December twenty something, um, but. Uh, just as a refresher for folks for CPAC, there were originally 15 proposals that were brought forward. Actually, uh, yeah, 15 proposals, of which four of them were recreation-based. So Crocker Farm Elementary School Playgrounds, Fort River Community School, um, the Community Rec Fields, the War Memorial Bathhouse, and the War Memorial Pool Improvements. Um, if anybody had been keeping track, I know we mentioned it in one of the last calls as well, but um, we typically have a neighborhood of two to three million. Um, oh, Sarah, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Andy. I just wondered if you could clarify. I don't know what CPAC is. I'm not sure what we're talking oh, about. Oh, yeah, of course. Yeah, sorry about that. Thank you. So it's the Community Preservation Act commi uh, oh, Committee. Okay. So it's part of your know, CPA, and then we add the C on for fun at the end. But it's um, about eight or nine folks, I want to say. You've, we've got representation from various uh, boards, and there are some at large members as well as well um and it's essentially you know we we evaluate proposals for funding for projects that fall under one of four different categories recreation open space um historic preservation and community housing gotcha. and there's some rule there's some rules around how the money gets allocated but um typically uh we have about you know two million or so to to allocate and the the requests, the proposals we get are kind of right around 2 million. So we've been able to approve just about everything. Um, I say that because I've been on the committee for the last two years. So this is my third go round. And based off that experience, that's where we've been. This year, there was over $8 million worth of proposals. So we knew originally or right up front, there would be some, some significant challenges to make this work. Um, there are some, some mechanisms we can use, uh, debt service and so forth to be able to Kind of stretch that out a little bit, but um, I did want to recognize uh, Sonia Aldrich and Sean Manja Man Mangiano. Mangiano. Um, Mangan. All right. I'm so, apologize, Sean, for the for that. But um, they they went through and helped us really um, uh, develop a path to be able to get as many of these projects approved as possible at smaller amounts. Um, so of the rec committee proposals, the Crocker Farm Elementary School, um, that one was was actually just pulled from consideration. So um, it was deemed not particularly time sensitive. And so uh, Doug Slaughter uh, pulled that. Um, the War Memorial Bathhouse, the War Memorial Pool Improvements, which Amy presented to us uh, in detail in a previous meeting, those were both approved at full funding levels. And then, you know, when I mentioned the 8 million, really the big, um, the big uh, bogey in that was the, the Fort River Rec Fields project, which was a $3 million ask. Um, without getting into like all of the details, this is tied to the potential, you know, $100 million uh, development of the schools. There's some concern that, um, the budget override, given the, the magnitude of it, that it may not be palatable to voters, but but if we could use some CPAC money to subsidize that a little bit and reduce the overall ask, then maybe it would it would make it easier to pass. Um, that said, it was um, the the committee did approve 
a smaller amount. So 404, or I'm sorry, it was uh, 700,000, which is going to, would be a, a bonded. So it would be a, a debt service that I think we amortize that over 10 years. So essentially 70,000 per year would come out of that. That's contingent upon obviously the, the project being um, approved um, this spring. So that said, um, you know, I think good to have, you know, the two fully at War Memorial, Fort River, you know, smaller amount. I did just, just for my own um, benefit, I did want to call out because uh, I, I was not in favor of the 3 million as, as proposed. And I think there's some folks who may be confused because I'm on the rec commission and I, you know, it is a very important thing to me. Um, you know, my, my concern was not around the investment. It was just around sort of the mechanism of, um, of how it was kind of presented as this 3 million may make it, um, may make the, the overall project more um, passable or more kind of appetizing to, to, um, to residents and, you know, I, I didn't think that that actually had any impact on whether this would pass or not. So, you know, I was more inclined to uh, to to vote for some of the community housing. So, again, I, some folks may be confused by that. But um, anyhow, that's the roundup. Happy to answer any questions that folks may have. Any questions on CPAC? I would like to very publicly thank Andy and Matt because I know it was a, a heavy, the, the amount of ask this year, the amount of sort of strain that it took to try and make decisions. It's shopping with a very limited budget. And I think that you know, they were asking great questions of us. They were asking great questions of each other from when I was like, uh, uh, Town Hall was very happy with the commission, uh, with the CPAC committee. Uh, in the way that they were trying to 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 honor their their responsibilities in making those decisions, I am a director of a town department, and so obviously when the decisions are made and funded, my job as a director is to essentially respond to those decisions. Um, you know, I'm appreciative of I would I would have been appreciative if the answers were no because I would have assumed that that the you know, articulate defense that Andy just offered there, if it was no's to all the things that we said we wanted or needed, then I would have assumed that that was for a reason. And as a public servant, I would have found a way to try and figure out what we're doing and what we do now. Um, but with the yeses, yeses also lead us, for myself, for the Rec Commission, we're going to have to try and figure out, okay, so we have this money, what are we going to do? The Fort River project, if that passes, if if we get through all the phases that are still in front of us, but that Fort River project is goes through the three million is is successful and and the, the, the CPAC investment is involved in those recreational fields. That is our next home and trying to figure out what our relationship is with the school department. And in terms of maintaining those fields, in terms of making those fields work for programming, in terms of sharing access, and any other any other sort of what were the next steps there, that is the next major concern for my department. Uh, of course, when it comes to War Memorial, that that is the middle of about two or three different long-term visions. We want to make sure that you know, the next steps now, if we have, uh, if that is funded in full, if that is something that we now are on the, the next stages ourselves, DPW, uh, you know, our programming now has to figure out how to make that, make the yeses work for us. Um, the great thing about CPAC is that when you, if you get that shiny little prize, you get the, get the award money or you get the, the ability, you get the okay to go and shop the way they, they, the way we've asked to shop. Now we have to make programming work and that's where my department and the commission's advocacy make things work for us. So our work isn't done because we sort of weighed in on the, on the proposals because we thought about them and asked questions. 
our work now becomes how do we responsibly spend that money and then build them outside of that. So, um, and so again, thank you to uh, Andy and the CPAC. Fair enough. Um, moving from that, uh, we have another guest, which I'm excited because I don't like hearing myself talk. I like hearing her talk. Uh, she's a panelist here, and we know her well. Uh, Nikki Abelli is here to give us updates on Winterfest. And we're right on time. Nikki Abelli is here to give us updates on Winterfest. We've been working to try to put Winterfest back into a, a, uh, a primary spot in the, in the culture of the, of the town here is the pandemic, of course had it shuttered for a little bit. Last year we tried and then we sort of hit Omicron right at the time where, where we had to scale way back on Winterfest. We have a plan for Winterfest this year, partnerships with uh, several entities and I asked Nikki to come and just give us updates on Winterfest. Nikki, are you here? I am here. Hi everyone. <laughs> um, my apologies, my camera is also not working and I don't know, just another little little cherry on the Sunday for today, I guess. Um, but yeah, so let me start off with, um, you know, talking about Winterfest. I was, you know, on the committee for many, many years before the pandemic hit. Um, so I'm very excited that we get to bring it back into some capacity. We're definitely easing into it, which is great and I think is important. Um, and just trying to take highlights from what we provided in the past and making them manageable and also provide some fun, free entertainment for our community. So um, I am excited to announce that we have made partnerships with, now th this is a mouthful, so get ready. Um, <laughs> the BID, the Chamber, Amherst Cinema, the Mill District, the Senior Center, the Jones Library, Big Brothers, Big Sisters, and Cress. So um, some of these community partners will be providing uh, you know, entertainment, performances, or events on their own. Uh, some will be partnering with us for major events, um, and others are just there to provide support in terms of setup, cleanup, execution. So let's uh, let's get it kicked off. So I know we haven't had the most uh, white winter in history, but that doesn't matter because it's still winter in New England, and we'll get people out with some fun things. Um, so we have our kickoff event at Cherry Hill, which is going to be Saturday, January 28th from uh, 12 p.m. to 4 p.m. And it's kind of like a mini version of what our grand finale used to be in the past. Um, so we're looking at a blazing bonfire um, with you know marshmallows, we're getting hot chocolate. Our main partner here is the Mill District, which is awesome. Um, they're also going to be our shuttle station instead of Mill River which is much nicer. Um, so people can, you know, hop on, take a, you know, little, little bus from the mill district over to Cherry Hill, enjoy what we have and then be able to, you know, get back without worry. Uh, we will make sure that we have, you know, handicap parking and, and available parking within the Cherry Hill lot for those who need it. So that won't be a concern. Um, we're also gonna have the Fosty Friend uh, Kids Carnival that's actually going to be run by Big Brothers Big Sisters. Um, so we're, we're you know solidifying all of these things this week, but as right now I'm like, they're all 99.999% happening, you know what I mean? Um, so, you know, kids will be able to play as many games of chance as they would like. They get prizes. We'll have craft tables with like two or three different crafts available. Um, if there's snow, we have uh, sleds available because I know sleds are very expensive and we want to make sure that friends have access to, um, you know, equipment. So we're going to have that. There's also the Winterfest Wildlife Explorers Hunt, um, which features, I believe, eight to ten uh, regional animals that are placed on lawn signs throughout the Cherry Hill Golf Course. So it encourages people to walk around the course and enjoy the course. Um, and they all have fun animal facts on there and they can turn in their little guide and get a get a little gift. Uh, we're also going to be doing um, Cardboard classic, bringing that back. And that's gonna be snow or no snow because the kids can show off what they made. It can really be almost an art piece at that point. They get a fun trophy. It's a good time. 
Um, and then we are looking at a couple of golf contests that will go on during the day. Um, those will be, you know, gift cards to Cherry Hill will be the price and the incentive. Um, we'll have the cross country and hiking tra trails open. The senior center will be tabling the event, perhaps um, with some senior helpers who want to just show off, you know, some little arts and crafts that they have been doing. And um, also, like I said, the Mill District. Um, I know Ray and I were discussing a possible uh, Nordic ski demo, but that, of course, is weather permitting. And of course, it is permitting, you know, whoever is, is you know, would be in charge of that and running that and all that jazz. Um, so moving on from that, sprinkled throughout, like I said, we'll have, you know, the libraries doing things. We are excited to announce a partnership with Amherst Cinema. Uh, we had a great meeting with them yesterday morning uh, discussing their family uh, film series that are for $5. So $5 family film series. And we're kicking it off on February 4th, the day of the Luminaria. Um, and it's a frozen sing-along. So, I mean... Come on, I mean, the kids still love it. And I think it's great. And I think it's really awesome. Um, we also made sure to purchase a number of tickets that we will distribute through the Family Center, um, as well as our after school programs for children who may not have access to um, afford movie tickets and want to have a good time. So we're going to do that. And then leading into, um, and please, anyone ask any questions. Sometimes I could just ramble on and speak really quickly. Um, we have uh, the Luminaria, so that's awesome. That is a wonderful event. That is a major partnership with um, the bid in the chamber to execute that. And what we have is, you know, it's 1,500, 2,000 Luminary bags. Um, if you don't know what those are, they're just like little paper bags. Uh, they have a little tea light in it, sand, and they're decorated in a nice little pattern on the town common. Um, and we're looking into getting a local cafe to provide free hot cocoa or very very inexpensive hot cocoa at a dollar a cup um and we'll have a bunch of our our community partners tabling that event as well and it's really just a hey come by when you can it's from 5 p.m to 7 30 walk around enjoy yourself and you know it's really promoting our businesses in the center of amherst making sure that hey you know what we're here let's go have a bite to eat let's go check out the toy store like all that good stuff um and then we are wrapping up with the uh, Bids Presents uh, Fire and Ice, which is supposed to be a fantastic, absolutely fantastic ending to our Winterfest um, schedule this year. There will be life, uh, sorry, uh, live ice carving. Um, there will be ice sculptures. There's gonna be, we'll be doing um, our, we're doing a craft table with um, snow tie dye and some other painting crafts. And again, these are all free of cost whenever we table an event um, for anything like this. And it, it you know, it's gonna have entertainment. It's gonna be a lot of fun. And uh, we're really, really excited for that. And I'm happy to answer any questions or if you have no questions, that's good too. Um, oh, I will mention, so our calendar, I know people are wondering, oh my gosh, like, but where and when and how? So <laughs> I'm working on a uh, QR code link tree of sorts. So we'll be able to, um, one, highlight all of our community partners and make it accessible. So you can just scan that QR code and it will show all the links to our community partners as well as our uh, calendar for uh, Winterfest, which will be primarily on Facebook. I think, uh, did, I, did I cover that right? <laughs> you covered plenty. Is there, is it, you can pause for a second because there are a couple hands up. Oh, please, hands up. Um, uh, let's go. Okay, Andy. Andy. Francis, first. Andy, you're muted. Oh, okay, all right, no, thanks. Um, yeah, well, thanks for the uh, the energetic presentation, Mickey. That's um, it's good to hear the stuff. I mean, you kind of answered some of my question, which was um, where is sort of the calendar. I'm not a Facebook user, um, so I guess what you know for me to get this, am I going to the uh, to the website or you know how how else are we getting the calendar out to folks? 
Wonderful question. So it is going to be a digital flip book almost, if you can imagine that. Um, so it'll be accessible on our website as well. And that will be in the link tree um, through the QR code. So we will make sure, and as well as the town website, um, it will have a link so that everyone can come and see what we're offering. Okay, cool. And then I guess another question. So you mentioned it's on Facebook. Do we do outreach on other social media platforms? Um, so we, <laughs> in the past, we have done, um, you know, we've tried them all, the, the Snapchat, the Twitters, the Instagrams, um, all that stuff. And it really does require a, a full-time person to put the energy into making those effective. Um, we're not against it, of course. Uh, but yeah, right now where I think our focus is that we, we have a, uh, dormant uh, YouTube account, but we can always, you know, make little videos and post them up there. Okay, great. Thanks. We have, uh, thinking about departmental sort of stuff, we have talked a little bit about the organization of our org chart and, and what we're doing with marketing. And uh, uh, right now, our, our, our marketing is, you're basically talking to the marketing team here because uh, Nikki's here and she's <laughs> she is she's our social media person. It does require us to have somebody that is it's able to make their job to be able to call it. I think I I'm trying to get us into we do have a YouTube station. We do have uh, uh, we do have access in other places, but in order to do it well, we are looking for activity and we're looking for a sustained sort of uh, effort and, and monitoring. Um, but um, um, that is sort of a future, that's a future planning uh, question for us. Great question. Carolyn. Um, I, I wanna say, I also appreciate all the creative energy that's going into Winterfest. It's, it's, really, it's really impressive, the things you guys come up with. Um, and I'm sure it really helps to attract people. I didn't, here you mentioned snow making. Did you mention snow making, or do we not have a machine anymore? Yeah, uh, we do have the snow machine. I don't want to speak on behalf of John, our superintendent of facilities at Cherry Hill, but um, I know we do. Um, I I personally don't know the capacity in which it produces snow, so I don't want to speak on that. Um, but I'm sure something could be done. Um, but I think we're gonna we're gonna figure all that out, and hopefully. I'm just fingers crossed that we're going to get this major nor'easter before a week before, and it's going to be a winter wonderland over there. I'm sure it is. My concern, <laughs> my concern has been uh, typically, sorry, I'm plugging in my power. Uh, my concern has been that, uh, uh, that the nor'easters come and then they melt so fast that it's hard to be predictable even when we get that snow. Um, this is one of those places where, speaking in advance, if if uh, you know, if I hear Carolyn's question as being an encouragement to fire up that snow machine and to and to make snow by hook or by crook, if 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 the encouragement here is for us to make sure there's snow out there, then that is this would be great practice for the commission to twist my arm. Um, <laughs> so. I so I can twist our arm at Cherry Hill. Um, there is some uh, uh, there is some resistance from us to do it for for a variety of different reasons. Um, uh, but but I think that that would be a case where the advocacy for the community, if if we need snow and you don't want me to 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 look look in a direction that that doesn't involve snow. And please feel free to to uh, twist for me, Carolyn. Follow up. Um, I don't know how encouragement, you know, how much encouragement we could give give to move it along. Um, but I think, at the very least, if we are able to advertise it beforehand, um, if we can get a snowmaker that works, I think it will right. probably help a lot in attendance. Um, you know, especially for the cardboard classic, which I think we've made snow for before. Yeah. It's it's important. This is Winterfest, and if we can possibly get at least that on there, I think it would attract a lot more people. 
for for the uh, and I see your hand, Andy, again. But uh, for the people who are uh, familiar with Winterfest and have a long history with Winterfest and participated or what have you, I guess one of the things I could ask you is. Have you ever had a Winterfest without snow that was amazing and magical and that sort of thing? What are the experiences without it? What are the experiences with it? Um, if if it's not a big deal, then it's not a big deal. But I know, like, I'm, I love snow. Personally, I love snow. I wish it would snow every day. Uh, winter is my favorite season. Snow is my favorite thing in the world. I would love to have snow every day. And I think Winterfest is added by that. The, I think the... the I agree that the attraction there is with the snow. Um, you know, if there are people who, who, whose great memories of Winterfest are, are heavily attached to the, uh, to the presence of snow, then feel free to share that with us and share that with me. Um, Andy. Yeah, so um, if I were trying to make sure I'm following correctly, we we have access to a snow machine or we would like rent a snow machine we have had uh we have a we have snow machine we have snow making abilities we have had that in the past i don't know i've never been uh, i've never been involved in the conversation to make or not make i've been involved in the conversation in terms of how much uh how much work it takes uh, in my mind i've never i've never actually seen a snow machine operate but in my mind, it's like you turn it on and there's snow. It just shoots snow out and there's snow out there. My understanding now is that it's a lot more complicated than that. And it does take some, a little bit of work, a little bit of effort. Um, but yeah, but, uh, I mean, no, no doubt that it does, right? Otherwise, everybody would be using it. But I, I guess like if we have access to one, you know, we don't have a ski slope like this. What else are we using it for? You know, this seems like the perfect application. So um and I, I would say that, uh, in my experience, for kind of winter festivals, it's winter a winter festival. Snow is and and ice and things like that are a big part of uh, a big part of that. So I would make a motion to fire up the snowmaker. Um, I do think it's something that you know, if we really want to um, be prepared, um, then then we should we should plan on doing that. In, in in the case that we don't have Mother Nature helping us out, so. I'm, well, I'm if that's a motion, I second it. <laughs> I, I, uh, I hear the motion. The motion has been seconded. Uh, I, as the director, and Nikki is taking notes. Uh, uh, that'll be uh, whether whether you need to twist my arm and continue to twist my arm on it. Uh, we will be putting our heads together about how to how to make that a priority for us and. and it may be that somebody tells me that it's impossible. I don't know. I don't, I'm not predicting that. But if somebody were to tell me it's impossible, if somebody was to tell me that it's going to cost us a lot of money, if somebody tells me for whatever reason that, that might end up putting brakes on that conversation, uh, I want to see the thing work. Uh, and I want to see snow. So right. <laughs> if it, yeah, it, I was going to say, like, if we can't do it for this, we should just sell it. Like, I, I don't know what else we need for. I think uh, its original intention it was, yeah, was to do that. I, I um, never personally saw it in action, so I can't speak to, you know, its effectiveness or anything because I would just show up and be like, oh, yes or no, um, and just told to go on with, with my duties as assigned. Um, but Ray and I, yeah, we can absolutely look into it, see what its, you know, capacity is like, if it's a, if it's a, an amazing thing and we've just been holding on to it. Yeah, let's go. Um, if it's, you know, spurting out there, you know, random snowflakes, then uh -oh, we gotta see what else we can look into. Well, I would say even if, even if you can't run enough to get snow collecting, I think just being able to walk underneath it, mm. especially on a day when there isn't snow. Like if you could just walk underneath some snowflakes, then that that I think would also be really fun. Brings the magic. <laughs> yeah. And, and I, if I can, ahead. I'm sorry. Um, I was Go gonna ahead, say if, if I I, uh, I know I'm repeating myself, but if we can publicize it, if if we get a yes, and we have time to publicize it, I really feel like it's an important thing. That was that was the other. I was uh, I was just gonna reinforce what you had said earlier. I was going to say the, the biggest thing that I heard 
in Carolyn's uh, question and follow up was if we can if we can advertise that we have the snow make the, the snow machine there's going to be snow then that potentially draws people it's maybe even especially if there's not snow in the forecast maybe even especially if we don't know if there's snow in the forecast and so that is a way of getting people uh, sucked into that magic yeah well we are we are meeting with John um Thursday so you know before even the calendar goes out we'll we'll be sure to have an answer oh, to some regard <laughs> thank you mm -hmm. so I get uh, that's a, a question I'm sorry just you know given given our you know monthly ish cadence we won't meet again before then so um you know do you have everything you need from us or is there like um do you, you know, is, is there, do you, do you, yeah, I don't know how to phrase it, but like, you, you know, you look into it and then like, um, if it, if the response is, hey, it's going to be too hard, like, can you just indicate how much we're pushing? I mean, it's, it's more of a, more of a, um, we're, we're telling, not asking type of thing. Two things on that. Uh, first thing is, my new chair and I, in the middle of our conversation, part part of that conversation, I think that's a strong position for advocacy. Uh, Carolyn, you can follow up with me as we talk about setting up February and, and what happened. Um, that that is a position that that you know, I think the chair, our chair, should be free to advocate for. And if we're worried that there's not a meeting time between now and the time that we would be doing it, then uh, trust Carolyn that we that we will that will be on our conversation. That'll be a matter of our conversation to make sure that you know, we're we're uh, exploring what we need to explore in those in, in that conversation. Uh, the second thing is I do want to turn over just ask Nikki if there's anything. Any volunteer stuff? I heard in Andy's question also. Is there anything that you need from us? Is there, uh, is there anything that the commission can do between now and then that we that we need or are looking for? We know we're talking to Yusuf about some of the things that that uh, he's done in the past and some of the resources that he provides for Winterfest. Uh, is there anything, Nikki, that the that the commission should be thinking about or can offer that we may need? Yeah, sure. Um, so it, you know, obviously no, no need if you can't do it, but we're always looking for hands who want to, you know, even if it's just being there for the event, like that we have these larger events, that would be awesome. Um, it gives an opportunity for the public to see you guys and, you know, who's, who's behind, you know, the, these, these big decisions that, you know, involve all of us. Um, primarily, uh, you know, somebody who may want to you know attend to the fire the blazing blazing bonfire you know someone who wants to be in charge of that or um someone who wants to help us fill luminary bags on on that day I mean I don't I don't wish that on anyone else but um we would be doing it inside the bit in the chamber they lovingly are letting us uh work in there and then we put them all on sleds and bring them down to the common um Alternatively, if you're a golf enthusiast and you want to run our contests for the day of um, the kickoff, you know, we're not, you know, that's, that's definitely open as well. And if there are no takers, totally respect all the respect for that. Um, we still appreciate everything that you do. And um, thanks for that list, Nikki, I guess, um, just for maybe sake of organization, is that, is that maybe written down, right? If here are the options um, so that, you know, we can, we can follow up on that. And then one of the items that I was wondering too is, um, you know, is there like an Amherst rec table? Is, is this the type of thing where there's going to be, you know, um, a window of time where it would make sense for, uh, you know, us to be there representing Amherst rec and then, uh, if that is Kate, the case, or maybe even if it isn't, um, I think it might be useful for us to be able to have sort of a, you know, 2023 
forecast. I don't know, like here are some things that you should be watching for that mm -hmm. we could, yeah. you know, that we could bring forward. Um, you know, if people want to approach us and and ask, well, what what is happening? Um, rather than just say, hey, go to the website or look for the mailer, like are there <laughs> right, right. I, or, or something you can provide us. Yeah, so absolutely. Multiple, multiple yeah. questions here. Oh, sorry. Um, yeah, I can absolutely write down these options, send them to Ray, and then Ray can send them off to everyone um, in the morning, no problem at all. And um, I don't see any, re you know, we tend to table any event that even that we put on um, with promotional materials, etc. However, uh, you know, why not for the kickoff event, have you guys inside the clubhouse and make a fun table that looks actually inviting um, <laughs> and that, you know, people come in and, you know, ask questions you can display what we're working on all that good stuff i mean that's an option we're, we're open to anything and we can make really most anything work um for for recognition that's not uh you know online based thank you yeah thank you and so we're we are excited because winterfest is back we're excited because I lost the opportunity to 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 sort of experience that last year. Um, the I think the town is looking for that opportunity. We've had a bunch of different opportunities to get people in large crowds and out moving and stuff. So it feels a little bit normal when we're in when the thing like Winterfest comes off. I think the general feeling is that we feel a little bit more normal. We feel like the town is moving in a direction which is which is pre-pandemic um, is safe is family fun it's it's uh we have we have all the pieces that i think makes my department uh excited to engage the community um fair enough uh any last questions for nikki before i tell her she can go away <laughs> or stay thank oh, you nikki yeah, you know. <laughs> Thank you, Nikki. Thank you all very, very much. And I hope you enjoy uh, the rest of your evenings and I'll I'll be in touch. All right, Bye. take care. Thank you. We are, uh, I actually feel like my times are right on, right on, uh, right on the mark here today. Um, so now briefly, uh, project updates, some, uh, some relatively small right now because they're in the middle of, of activity. Uh, I can go backwards because Amherst Community Theater is very much that they're the most you know, uh, far, far along in where they are. Amherst Community Theater has Little, Thera Little Mermaid coming in. Uh, the presentation of Little Mermaid is coming up towards the end of the month. It is Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday at Balker Auditorium. I do just want to say it's less of a project, but uh, it's another one of those things that we do that we haven't done in a while. I am really, really excited about the opportunity to come out here and see that. I'll be there a few times, probably. Uh, my staff will be working the box office and I'll, I'll be swinging over there to see it. I love uh, theater, musical theater. So it's, it really was a perk when I got a chance to step into this role and then realize that we are we have under our umbrella the, the, the fine work of the, of the community theater and the volunteers that put that on and the professionals that put that on, I promise it to be an amazing show. Um, I sort of said this as a, as a joke at our department head meeting, but I, I think I'll be there enough and I'll be just enough of a nerd in the, in the audience there that if somebody goes down with an injury or an illness, I think I'm gonna, I, I think, I think I'm, I'm gonna live my fantasy and run up on stage. Uh, yeah, so I, I say that and you know, the, the dates are there. If anybody has, is interested in getting tickets, you can get the tickets through the direct department offices. If you know people who might be interested, people with kids, people that are fans of theater, uh, send them our way because we'd love to have them. Um, and so uh, to the hat to the Amherst Community Theater, who've been putting in a lot of hard work on performance, set design, costuming, everything. Uh, youth empowerment. Uh, uh, we have restarted the conversation in earnest. 
uh, myself and uh, parts of the town council. We have started to talk about, about taking uh, my notes from our early exploration of youth empowerment. Both Andy and Sarah were, were in other worlds when we were talking about that last year. Uh, last year's uh, last year's ARPA grant for a youth empowerment center was directed. We were given the the task and responsibility. We accepted the responsibility of doing the early exploration of how to spend the ARPA money. Uh, uh, money that was set aside for the purpose of building a youth empowerment center in town. We are looking right now at move, at sort of changing some of that. It got to be a little much given that there were interests in doing it right away. And in terms of in terms of you know, how we thought that money was best spent, and also in terms of in terms of just some mechanical issues about what we uh, how we put that together. The youth empowerment center, the youth empowerment idea right now is a combination as we. Start the conversation again. It's a conversation between my notes and some of the people on the council who were heavily involved in as private citizens originally, but then later on as as counselors that, that are very vested in that that idea and what the initial thoughts were. We're putting our heads together to see if we can't we can't make something happen with. The, the ARPA grant and with our with our collective visions. We we had a couple brainstorming sessions. We're we're going to be working together here, and we're hoping to have something some traction on that ASAP. Andy, thanks, Ray. Um, I guess I'm curious. So, one, how much money is there? And when you mentioned to sort of build an empowerment center. Um, like what what are we thinking the scope of that entails? Is that just like getting staffing? Is that getting space? Is that um any, anyway, just as you mentioned, I was not part of this world, so I I I, need to that, uh, I can I think I can do the reader's digest version here, because uh, I will start talking about it for a while. Um the youth empowerment for me, uh as it was introduced, it's an idea that we have in in an ideal, in a pie in the sky, it's to have a physical center, it's to have a physical building, a youth drop-in center with professionals working, with where where we can where we can basically have space where especially kids in that gap area that we've done a lot of thinking about and planning around, that those like middle school age, it's basically sixth to ninth graders that are especially uh, Targeted by our efforts to give them something that's their own, something creative, something that 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 they can that they can build their their futures with, their presence and their futures with. Um, that uh, uh, that idea, you know, build. You, know, you asked how much money. There's five hundred thousand dollars, I believe, it's five hundred thousand dollars in that grant. There's five hundred thousand dollars in it, which was to run a feasibility study and to start the investment. That's not enough money to build a spot on a bus line and access and everything. That's not, we didn't get enough money. And I don't think the intention was to, to build a great new shining temple. Uh, uh, we would love to have that as a future goal, but uh, right now we're thinking that the, the that our focus is going to be on on um, initiating or continuing or to uh, uh, promote some of the services that a youth empowerment center would be able to do. Some of it is right in line with what we do with the rec department already. Gym space, give people a chance to get in there and get exercise and to uh, sort of run around, have fields to play on, have have games to play and game rooms and stuff. We're thinking about this is like when we talk about youth empowerment, there's a lot of Different ideas about what youth empowerment entails. That may be uh, uh, youth empowerment may be uh, uh, co-curricular. It may be school sort of stuff. Uh, we're talking about doing doing. Uh, have, we have ideas around job training, resume building, uh, uh, speech classes, 
uh, thing like public speaking sort of sort of opportunities, things like like uh, 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 financial literacy, which uh, I think the school department we're, we're we're talking about the school department also, but the school department will talk about uh, how how a lot of the things that we remember through our through our you know, times growing up and from what we what the model of education was before things like home ec and financial literacy. A lot of times, those are things that are casualties in the school department, or they just don't have uh, mandatory access to to kids, and so some kids might get it from the schools, and some kids very easily could just shift by those sorts of things. But trying to find ways to invite people in to give them some of the things that help build them for where their futures are. Uh, starting looking at at you know, there's a lot of inclusion sort of things that go into empowerment about acceptance and inclusion, about lifting people up and acknowledging people. There's some cultural literacy that would go into youth empowerment. There's some civic civic sort of sort of responsibility or civic training or that sort of thing that could help them. Things like getting around in a car or like, there are a bunch of different things that that I think could go into this and, the, and we're trying to, to sort of narrow that down into a digestible form that we can put on the table and start start in, in the direction of building programming here. We, we don't want rec, the rec department to be ball and sport uh, and sort of have that be what we're doing. If we're involved in this long term, we don't have to be, rec department doesn't have to be involved in this or have this be our project long term, but we are working to try and make sure that because at least part of it is recreation is in line with our recreational interests. We want to try and make sure that, that that we are steering some of that in the early stages. I see your hand, Sarah Ewell. Thanks, Ray. Um, I just wanted to, I'm curious and wanted to raise um, in terms of the youth empowerment funds. Um, is that something, you know, thinking about that sixth through ninth grade age, like right now, any kids who want to be involved in sports outside of like the recreation stuff, there's no transportation for them. Um, there are, there is nothing like model UN or things like, I mean, essentially when we talk about like equity for kids, and like empowering kids, basically their parents have to be able to do that. And so I guess I'm just curious, like are funds like that, is that something we could talk about as a possibility for funds for, yes. for something like that? So early on, there's another grant, which uh, which we got in ARPA last year, which we've been waiting to try and tie into this and tie into a couple other things that we're doing in the department as to how we use it. But the, the biggest goal for a $200,000 grant uh, for enhancing department goals, we started looking at transportation. We did a lot. We had more access and, and recreation for transportation before. That's one of those targets that we've been thinking about, uh, sort of investing in at least in the short term. That doesn't that doesn't mean that we'll have it every year, but that two hundred thousand dollar grant at least can start to go and bring people in. Yes, independence is one of those things that we're looking at trying to coach and and provide the access to independence for kids. It doesn't help if they're not on a bus line, if they're not, they don't have the ability, if it's too far removed, if it, um, when we were looking at a physical space, we knew that it was gonna have to be on a bus line, it was gonna have to be within a shout station, within easy access to the schools, because we're looking at after school time. Uh, we're looking at, I forgot about, uh, when I was talking about the different ideas for youth empowerment, we also talked about the recreational interests of art and, and uh, performance sorts of things that would that would ideally be attached to this youth empowerment sense. There's a lot of ways that people look to try and get that recreational energy, but uh, in order to be attached to the schools and their after school uh, opportunities, we we want access. Uh, you know, we we started looking. Don't don't assume that I'm thinking that this is where we end up going because there's a lot of reasons why it's why it'd be a bad idea. But when uh, you know with Wildwood. Uh, with the situation with Wildwood and closing down, we started thinking, well, what if we were to make that our home? What if we were to make that, what if we were to, to one of the reasons why it's closing down is because of the amount of money that it would take to make that work. But try to find a space that is proximal, um, uh, with, with, is within reasonable proximity to where kids are and where kids could, could create, uh, create sort of a, a sense of themselves. Um, um, and so, so yes, access is a major issue. If we if we housed 
programming instead of a physical building right now. We house programming out of the schools or out of some space. Those are the parts that we have to get to, but absolutely a, 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 a an absolute priority for us is going to be uh, creating programs that, that are accessed easily by, by the kids. Um, I guess I just want to raise, and I know, you know, we're, my family right now is, is deeply involved in basketball, and I'm just going to use it as an example, but I think it, it holds true is for any kid who wants to play middle school and next year that will be six through eight who wants to play middle school basketball and that's kind of a partnership between the school and the rec committee you know there's no transportation to any of the games and their practices are every night from seven or not every night but two or three days a week from seven to nine and so i guess when i'm thinking about transportation i'm just thinking not even like housing entire programs but i mean it, it's basically just a cost for a school bus and I, I know families who have pulled their kids out of competitive basketball because they don't have the resources to be driving their kids all over the Pioneer Valley or to leave work to get them to and from practice because there's no way, because these kids aren't just going to practice after school. And I know this is like one little microcosm, but I think it's like true across the board for kids six through ninth is like, there's no, there's no opportunity just to walk to something after school. It, it's parent dependent to get them back to school. And then if it's something that involves a competition, whether that's sports or, you know, if it's an academic competition, again, it's all parent dependent. And so I just wonder, it's not a conversation for tonight, but just kind of laying on the table that that, that issue of access is very real and, and kids that are getting pulled out of that because parents don't have a flexible work schedule or don't have a car or don't have X, Y, and Z, and then they get to high school and they don't have the experience. And so they're not getting to continue in those opportunities. Correct. Uh, I think well stated. Um, uh, I'm learning over the course of my time here, just how different it is to program for rec as it is for the schools. The schools have buses, schools have access to buses. And so when we pick up programs from the schools, I echo that same sentiment that, that some of the things that limit our access is busing. And so that's why that was the center of our thoughts for that ARPA grant for a little while, that 200,000 to try and come up with a busing plan, come up with a transportation plan, at least in the, in the, in the here and now, and give uh, ourselves a chance to collect data, to collect experience and say, this is an important piece. We've extended access, people are, they are our numbers are up because access is up. Our experience is better because because transportation is there. And to try and put that in future lines, try and put that in in our budget for the future, uh, try to convince the town that that is a worthy investment. The ARPA grant would not cover us for for year in year out. It's a grant that runs out when it runs out. Uh, but but to gather that information to be able to, to be able to use that money as a way of, of, of providing and showing what the use of that of that focus is is an important part of it the schools have a busing budget the schools have a transportation budget it's part of their responsibility it's part of it's built into their responsibility it's built into their budget as a, as a reflection we haven't gotten to that stage yet and so that has that we know that's been an issue for when we pick up programs from the school department. That's that has constantly been an issue for us in my short time. That's been a it's been a loud issue for us. Hey, when we were at the schools, we had buses that took care of this. When we were at the schools, we had so and so. So I hear you. Um, other questions about youth empowerment, comments, concerns. Last one is pickleball. Uh, uh, we, we, to give you an update on where we are there for Andy and Sarah, who have not been with us when we really got into the pickleball conversation last year. Um, uh, Andy, you were in CPAC, so you, you certainly uh, had access to what that push was. Right now, we are in the process of trying to find, as I call it, pickleball's forever home. Uh, they were granted, they being being the pickleball, the petitioners for a pickleball facilities last year were granted in CPAC a, uh, the, the, the money to explore a, a, a pickleball court, a set of pickleball courts here in, in Amherst. We're in the middle of that curve someplace. Uh, 
there are towns that are farther along in that conversation than we are. There are towns that would love to be where we are right now in terms of having a thumbs up and a yes on, on, on that process. Uh, uh, but pretty much every town is somewhere on that curve. Uh, pickleball is, is, a, is a sport for me as a director of recreation. It, is, it has all sorts of future benefits in terms of programming, in terms of getting kids active, in terms of creating generativity and trying to find a way to get the next generation interested in doing something. And uh, there are a lot of reasons why I like it. It, it satisfies a whole, it's, it, it, the interest in pickleball is especially uh, uh, it, that it's especially peaked in in senior age groups, uh, and that's an area that we don't have a lot of programming for. So part of this is also my saying we want to try and fill some of the gaps in our programming. But uh, but also we took on as recreation is it was a recreation request last year, and it's important that that, that when CPAC gives us a gives us a thumbs up and we're we're sort of Champion with the cause of finding its home, then I think that that's an important part of of our job here. We're looking at sites right now. Uh, we have a we have a, another sort of the, the next meeting that we have on this is intended to be one where we can start to accelerate that conversation about where that 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 site is. Um, it it isn't something that happens overnight, and I'm hopeful that when it does show up that all of you all will help me in advocating for for as much protection of that as much as much access as much activity on those courts as we can find but pickleball is coming and i'm happy to say that we are in the process we've been in the process for a little while but we are in the process of making that work i wish i had specifics for you at this meeting but that'll be the next one andy exciting stuff um, when you say it's coming, what, you know, and if you kind of crystal ball gaze here, are you thinking that, you know, we'll have a site selected in, you know, three months, six months, um, a year, you know, um, do we need, I, I think the seat back was like 120 grand. Uh, is that enough to actually go out and construct? So is it, is it just a matter of we find the site and we're, we're, uh, funded to build it or is there more work that has to happen after that? I'm going to not because I need her, but I'm going to pull Amy in just so that she's able to talk. Uh, if if there's anything that she wants to add to this, one second, multi panelist. Um, um, so to answer your question, that's one of the next. Uh, that's one of the next major task for us to find out if that hundred twenty thousand dollars is sufficient for what we're looking for. Um, there are a couple of proposals that we're going to have to weigh, a couple of sites and proposals that we're going to have to weigh that that are sort of long-term goals. They to say that to say that they would be the, the courts would be done right away if we choose them. It's attached to a bunch of different ideas that we have for recreational interests and town interests. Uh, those those goals might not be something where we have them set in three months, six months. Uh, but we do have, that's one of the reasons why we, why we brought in temporary courts over at Mill River. Uh, and we may be expanding those temporary courts if we don't have an immediate uh, court in line. Um, $120,000 would cover a couple of those. So we might be looking to try and see how we can get, get uh, uh, supplemental funding for those. But we have to find the site that makes the most sense for us before we can really figure out a calendar. How do I do any? That, no, that was good. I, you know, I think generally what you're sensing from us is that there, there's kind of a lot of that are, that's unknown. Um, there's no site that we've identified that we could just paint lines and be good to go. Like every site's going to need some construction. It's just a matter of where we go, whether it's um, like if we take the Mill River tennis courts, you know, technically we have to expand just a little bit that area to make the configuration work right now those courts are actually not quite legal size but they work um so if we wanted those to be multi-use we'd have to expand the fence line and you know put some additional pavement to make those work um but other sites that we're looking at would be putting um you know putting some pavement down somewhere to be able to put 
um, court, dedicated pickleball courts as opposed to multi-use courts at Mill River. So those are all very much still in the option and we're gonna have better ideas on the cost when we have better ideas on the site and what, what work it's gonna require. Some of them are gonna, some of the sites are gonna need a parking area as well as um, the areas depending on where we go, so. What what do you think the timing looks like, Amy, for when we might feel like we found the right spot? For when we feel like we found the right spot? Yeah. I'm hopeful that we could, you know, in the next couple of months, have a good feel of where we're going to go. Um, and then we'll have a better feel of the um, the timeline after that. Okay. Just curious, too, do you need, I assume the answer is yes, but does pickle do pickleball courts need to be fenced like a tennis court since the ball doesn't go as far? It does not. Okay, all right. I, I, I that's my understanding actually, Ray. I, you might play pickleball oh. and <laughs> barely. I've I've hit around. I don't know if the terminology is right. I've <laughs> I've barely played. Uh, that's coming next. Also, uh, I don't know if if large fencing is necessary. Uh, I can talk to my experts about that but uh, I don't know if it's if it's absolute or not um, I haven't okay. seen it with outfits yeah, yeah I feel like a lot of them when you look at them and again I don't know if this is technically that it's needed or if it's more for ease I feel like a lot of them have low fencing probably just if you miss the ball you're not running forever to right. retrieve it um yeah so. that makes sense I imagine that a tall fence is a, a quite an additional cost so Maybe if uh, you can do a low one, keep the dogs out, keep the ball in, then uh, who knows, maybe we can make when, that 120 go for it. Right. Yeah, and when it's done well, you have, I think the culture of pickleball is like, you know, pick up basketball on, on uh, you know, in, a, in a town where there's a lot of people coming over these courts and there's sort of a culture of waiting and there's a culture of, of sort of competition and, and mixed levels. Uh, one other piece that that should be mentioned in there is there should be we should be looking at doing stands and and sort of whether bleacher seatings or or some some sort of uh, seating arrangement there that we should be looking at seating in those spaces also. That's just for your matches, right, Ray? So we can all come in and watch. <laughs> I I'm gonna go and. And try and train in the dark or something. I'm gonna try and train in the shadows. I'm gonna go off. It'd be one of those old movies where I go to the sensei off in the in the in the uh, uh, in the in the fields in the woods or something. Sanjay. Yeah, Amy. If the um, if the Mill River courts are decided to be made into multi-use, meaning tennis and pickleball, what's the plan for the pickleball nets? How how do how does having the two sets of nets work and maintain playability yeah. for both sports? It's no, it's a good question. Uh, fortunately, most pickleball court um, nets are on wheels. Um, they're mobile. Um, that's just kind of the nature of them. Um, the tennis nets are not. And so that's part of the limiting factor of that space is that those tennis nets would remain and the pickleball courts would kind of be using half of the tennis courts um, and the, um, the nets would have to be moved. Um, you know, if, even if we go to another site, you know, the nice thing about it is even you, we have the possibility to kind of make these multi-use sites, you know, you can move all the things off and it could be a place for street hockey or something like that. Like we kind of have some possibilities because of the fact that these nets aren't permanent fixtures, they are, um, movable and that's just the nature of them. But DPW would contemplate leaving portable pickleball nets in the cage at Mill River, and I mean, I, what, I've what? I've asked about that. I'm like, are we gonna like attach it by like a chain to one wall so that it leaves? Um, I think right. I look, other people maybe didn't that. share my concern, but I share that same concern. <laughs> for the for the temporary courts that are set up there right now, we had a temporary lining of the tennis courts there of one of the tennis courts there into two different pickleball spaces um the the one thing that makes it difficult for us to really gauge what the community interest is in that is that we didn't put nets out there are the large people uh, large large numbers of people who play pickleball and are heavy into it have their own portable nets and they bring them with them for themselves but in terms of that drop-in 
folk, sort of drop-in folks, not having a net out there does challenge it. But because we we painted it, we painted those lines at a time where we were winterizing and the pools were closing. Uh, we didn't want to invest in new nets right now. We we're we we're going to have nets out there for the spring season, so we can gauge uh, you know, how many people come over and pick up from. For, we can if it comes down to having somebody go over and drop off net nets for them. But we want to try and do it as as a uh, sort of a departmental loan situation if we need to until we can find a way to secure it in that space on wheels to the fence or what have you. So we can find a way to make sure that it can stay there and stay uh, basically stay secure. So it's an investment that we can keep going. Certainly during the summertime, if those pools are open, then we can just we can basically you know, like a library card, we could basically loan them out of out of the pool house. But right now we don't have that flexibility. We'll stop over in the department office. Did it make sense for us for the fall? And so we just want to get lines down to give people access. But that that netting is is going to come in the spring. I mean, I'll put a I'll I'll just say a word for not making the Mill River tennis courts into multi use. Let's let's give the pickleballers a proper home, and. Okay. The, the you know the tennis courts i'm at mill river a lot um for baseball and the tennis courts are used uh you know perhaps not heavily but they are used and you know just regarding the nets and the equipment you know the mill river and the middle school tennis courts are maintaining even the nets on the tennis courts is a challenge for the town and i mean amy has heard me say this before right like Let's have a plan for taking care of this stuff and let's have a budget for taking care of this stuff, right? I mean, a tennis net is a couple hundred bucks. A pickleball net must be a little bit less than that. Um, we can't assume, DPW can't assume, rec can't assume that you're going to buy pickleball nets once and it's going to be good for 10 years, right? We don't want to, we don't, we don't want to end up with nice court surface and lines and no nets for people to hit over. <clears throat> Agreed. No, I, I, I agree with a lot of what you're saying, Sanjay, and I do appreciate the insight regarding, you know, as we're evaluating sites, knowing, you know, what, what the thoughts are on a multi-use, you know, tennis and pickleball, like that, that's helpful for us to, to hear your opinions on that. I mean, my observation is that the usage at the Mill River tennis courts is uh, by more beginner players than the middle school courts. That the, the group of people who tends to play at the middle school is a more advanced group of tennis players. And when I see people playing at the Mill River courts, they are beginners going out to have fun whacking a ball around. Um, and perhaps they're more tolerant of the sort of lower quality surface at Mill River than at the middle school or something like that. But um, it, it, is a, it is a different group. It's a group that's probably less likely to make themselves visible Right. In terms of like if you just if you said you were going to paint pickleball lines at the middle school, uh, you'd probably hear from the Amherst tennis players. I suspect that the people who play tennis at Mill River are not aware enough or kind of connected enough to self-advocate in that way. Um, but there is a there is, from my anecdotal observation, a community of people who use those courts for tennis. Thank you. That's that's actually very helpful. Sanjay. Actually, can I make a comment? Yes, please. At the cost of being contrary, um, I go there every day in the summer, and I've seen a lot of good tennis players there. So I would not argue for letting the courts go bad. <laughs> um, I, and I know people who play tennis over there. I, I think you're right. I think people give lessons there, and kids play there. But I don't think that's all that happens there. Yes, I hope you did not interpret anything I said to suggest that I endorsed uh, abandonment or or benign neglect of the Mill River courts. <laughs> um, okay, no, uh, I, 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 I understand. I don't think there's anything I said that could be construed that way, merely that the, the people I observe using those may not be as noisy as the people using the middle school courts, um, and that we should preserve their ability to play tennis. Yeah, I agree. I think it'd be great to, to have room for both, um, you know, as much room as possible for both. 
So if if I'm allowed to, Ray, am I allowed to just ask a question of the group? Um, you know, I mean, as we are looking at different sites, we're looking at various sites throughout the town, um, and a bunch of them are, you know, looking at town-owned properties. And so, you know, we think of Groff Park, we think of Kiwanis, um, we think of the cow field, um, and then at Mill River, if we're not looking at the tennis courts, the other potential location would be that side parking lot. So the parking lot to the left as you come in, which would take a bunch of parking spots away. Um, so I'm curious what people think about those different options. Some of them would take parking from a place that's used so much. That's my concern on that site is I don't wanna take, I get putting a lot of resources in one spot, but I'm nervous about an additional resource with less parking to have people access it. Um, but you know, there's there's all these various sites. So I'm just curious what you guys think about that. I, I welcome any input. Well, Amy, a couple of years ago when we were first approached about putting in pickleball courts, um, we all thought that that left side of Mill River was perfect. And we were pursuing it for a while and I don't know why it didn't go through, but I think there's been a decision made that that's not suitable. Ray, do you know the history of that? I do a little bit. There, there has been a concern raised that the parking lot, is, that parking space has been used uh, for for uh, community, there, that it is used for uh, community recreation. That there are things that they use there um, that, are, that happen in that parking lot that the community has interest in that we don't want to necessarily uh, um, displace. That's one of the big reasons why that uh, it's not the only reason, but that's one of the big reasons why we look for alternative uh, spacing. I think Amy's right, though. I think I don't know what the, what's happening with the cow field, but it seems like we have lots of other options in town. And, um, you know, I, I guess I don't know how you eliminate them or or not, but I think we should be active in that because I don't want to fall behind the other towns. Everyone's talking about it. Do you, do you have thoughts on which of those sites make sense to you or you know maybe have the ability to have this additional resource at it? Um, well, like I said, I don't really know what the deal with, is with the cow field. It used to be little, you know, it used to be baseball. I don't even know if that's used anymore. And it's pretty close to the traffic, so maybe not great. But um, it, somewhere in the center of town seems ideal. In many ways, we talked about Groff Park. I don't see. I don't know why things have been rejected in the past, but Ray might have those records somewhere. So I don't have a better idea. <laughs> no, that's it's it's helpful to hear all of this input because obviously the more voices we hear, we're we're trying to find the best site. But you guys use the different facilities and see how used they are on the weekend, or you know know where you'd like to be driving to do these things. So it's it's really helpful. Yeah, I, I, is it a is it a conversation with DPW? Is that what it boils down to, Ray? Um, it's a conversation with DPW at the town hall. Uh, you know, it, it's heavily DPW and town hall that we're in the conversation with. Is this something we need to set up? Uh, we are actually we we were going to meet today. Uh, we do have uh, our next meeting is scheduled for next week. Okay. All right, looking forward to hearing and, more and again, about this again and no. as commission, this is one of those things that the commission should be actively engaged in. Um, if you want to be a part of that, we can we can involve uh, commission members in that discussion directly if necessary. Okay. I'll throw out Ray that it, it may be perfectly appropriate to have the chair of your committee there. <laughs> so now that you have one, um, you know that that might be a helpful person to those conversations just to kind of hear how we're evaluating and to to add that voice how we do that i i am noting that right now we will offer you that opportunity to come in uh andy your hand is raised yeah thanks ray um so amy i, I think also a question relative to suitability would be is there an appropriate um north south orient like or orientation in the field because I, I thought that might be like is that an issue since i think the 
you know, if it's if it's north south, I don't know that that extra field or the extra parking space in in Mill, Mill River is maybe oriented the right way. But you know, whatever, whatever. Like I, yeah. I assume you need to make sure it's oriented appropriately. So that could be a first thing. I would say that in terms of the cow field. Um, so I've done some lacrosse stuff there, and it's just it's it's wet all the time. So I imagine like building something there is could be probably more effort than it's worth. It seems like Groff Park um, that there's a lot of space that isn't actively used. It, it kind of my opinion. So that would seem like a a useful spot to go, especially given the amount of reinvestment we've done there. It's like a gathering spot for people of all ages. Um, so, you know, I, I like that. I mean, ideally, I agree with, with Carolyn, if it could be closer to town, um, that would be wonderful. But um, I think Groff Park is a logical hub to sort of build out, um, given the investment that we've done there. A couple of responses. A couple of responses inside there. Yes, I appreciate that. Um, Groff Park, one of the spaces that we're looking at is definitely in Groff Park, is, is up in Groff Park. And one of the reasons why I think it's fantastic is because it does extend our investment in, in what Groff Park is becoming. There is space up there. There is There, there are places to do it. Um, um, it is a, it's a fantastic vision for how to use that space. And also, I think one of the things that the town is interested in is making uh, parts of Graf uh, that are not ADA compliant, ADA compliant. Um, and so that would be a that would be a challenge and a and a benefit of choosing Graf is that we could use that as a way of of, of moving to the forefront the issues of compliance on on Graf. Um, yeah, that all makes sense. And I'm sorry if I could just add one more thing is like I, I think Kiwanis just need like we need a vision for what we should do with Kiwanis because it's and it's like a clean slate almost right like we do lots of different things and it's one of the drier fields um in town so um maybe that's something we can talk about in the future yeah regarding your question on like the orientation I think there is an ideal orientation most of the time, although when we were looking at those parking spots at Mill River, you've got the benefit of kind of trees on three sides of it. So it eliminated that challenge yeah. for that one location. But yeah, typically you're using a more open space for these and you do have to kind of think about orientation so you don't have the sun directly in your eye. Yeah. Um, so. And, I'm with, and I, I agree with everything Sanjay said relative to the, you know, permanent installation requirement that having like a a temporary net seems like it's um, a recipe for disaster. As far as I'm concerned, again, thinking about that and Sanjay's point, as far as I'm concerned, the temporary nets are for our temporary courts out there. Our the, the goal for the forever home is to is to, as Sanjay said, you know, give them you know, give pickleball. Uh, you know, let pickleball have its space. Let, you know, sort of uh, give the, give them what they were looking for, and not make it sort of a, 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 a walk in, a sort of half hearted attempt to to uh, you know, just have something for them to play with. Um, our attempts to do that that temporary net is for that temporary court. While we're trying to figure out what a forever home is. Are there any other pickleball questions, comments, or concerns? I'm happy there's a little bit of energy about that. I'm always worried that, that, that pickleball, we know there's energy out there, but we don't want to add to it. <laughs> uh, uh, and so, I, again, I'm excited about the prospect of it coming in. I'm excited about what it does for the department. I'm excited about what it does for the community. It really is sort of an exciting idea at the very least. Um, but now we're trying to move that in a direction where, where we can we can say to the to the petitioners, we can say to the community, we can say to every everybody that's involved. Uh, yeah, Sarah, uh, Sarah's taking off. Uh, uh, thank you, Sarah. 
we'll be in contact about the last piece. Um, and so thanks for the pick wall. I will say uh, if, if there's no new business, I can get to sort of trying to pool without Sarah here. We have three members that are not here in attendance, so it doesn't make sense for us to you know, solidify a date for the next meeting uh, here online. But I can again ask about it. Are there any dates early February? I'd probably say maybe even maybe even during the Winterfest weeks. But are there is there any uh, resistance to having an early Monday February meeting? Maybe. Oh, your hand is still raised. Is that so? Uh, it's, it's a different one. So no resistance to that. I did just want to make a quick comment on the new business piece, if that's all right. Yes, definitely. Okay, I, and I, I will keep brief. It's just, um, you know, I, I mentioned in introductions that I'm involved with uh, with youth, youth lacrosse and coaching lacrosse at high school is, you know, I reached out to Jose. Well, I reached out to you, Ray, uh, this weekend that, you know, one of the things that we found certainly in lacrosse, but, you know, maybe in other sports as well, maybe, is that, um, you know, there's a there's kind of a barrier to entry and there's some some kids who may not even consider playing the sport because, you know, their parent didn't play the sport or they don't know what sort of equipment they need. And, uh, you know, it's been our perspective uh, from, from youth lacrosse that that, that that has limited some of our numbers. So uh, we've done this in the past, uh, you know, be working with Jose on trying to get, uh, you know, we've called it like trial lacrosse uh, for a day or like a lax day or something like that try to get some space. We bring equipment, we bring coaches, we bring players, and it's just, it's open to anybody to come out and try. And so, you know, we're thinking about lacrosse, but maybe other sports as well, um, you know, that it would be a, just a great way to maybe get some people out, get folks moving around, get them experiencing different things. So um, I, I'd, I'd love to kind of see that be a bit more of our mission is um, is you know getting getting those first experiences setting kids up with really positive first experiences uh, for that type of thing. So, so just wanted to share that. Thank you. And I really I you and I will be talking about that a bunch. I do like what lacrosse does with those. It was a cool thing to see that in my first spring aboard to see some of the things that lacrosse is doing. We've done things that are kind of similar with the Bruin street hockey thing last year. Uh, our, that, that's come up in my conversations about pickleball, about doing sort of it. Look, if you don't know this, let's just find a way to, to get get the equipment in your hands. You can sort of see what it is here. It's in phys ed curriculum uh, all over the place, but to get people to just sort of the experience of playing and playing pickup, playing casually, playing recreation, and maybe it turns into something. But I do like that model. Other new business? Andy, you and I can talk about that offline also. Um, uh, February meeting, uh, can we, are, are we free to go back to Mondays? I can find scheduled Mondays and try and sort of pull you all for early February if there's not early like vacation times or what have you. Hopefully we have our last member present also but I can send you all, I can canvas you all on email again and figure out what dates work best. Are Mondays an issue for anybody? Good as days any for me. I will start with Mondays and then move towards, and, and then we can, we can, if necessary, we can move to alternative dates. Sound good? Thank you all for being here. Thank you for going a little bit over here. Um, and I will be in touch soon. Uh, again, Winterfest, uh, you, can, you can check our website for Winterfest information. Get to Little Mermaid if you so desire. Uh, and if you have any questions, always feel free to reach out to me. Thanks, folks. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night.